Good morning and welcome to Kensburg UP Church. Whether you're joining us uh, online, down in the fellowship hall, or here in the sanctuary, we're so glad to be able to gather together to worship God. There's a few things uh, I wanted to make uh, mention of. Uh, first off, if you got a chance to, you noticed, uh, or you came out on Wednesday night on uh, August the 19th, we had a pop-up pan- uh, not pop-up pantry, pop-up uh, Pine Springs camp uh, that showed up. A lot of fun. Got to see some faces I recognize, some faces I didn't recognize, uh, both from our community and as far away as Waynesburg, coming to connect with Pine Springs Camp. We're so gr- glad that we were able to do that. Wonderful ministry, and we do hope and pray that they are going to be able to uh, uh, fully open back up for, uh, for summer camp 2021. And uh, you can also be uh, paying attention. We're, uh, they're probably going to be doing some fall uh, family weekend uh, events. So uh, we'll, make, uh, uh, we'll share that as soon as we hear more about that. Uh, something else uh, I, I mentioned last week, mark your calendar September 26th. Uh, the Adult Discipleship Ministry team is uh, uh, planning and hosting a, uh, a concert at North Strabane Township Park. And so uh, details about that will be coming out uh, uh, a little bit later, but you can mark your calendar now for the 26th of September. Tomorrow we're continuing the pop-up food pantry here uh, in partnership with the Ministerial Association. Uh, from 1 to 3, we're hosting Holy Rosary in Muse and Faith Chapel in Lawrence. And so if you or if you know somebody who is in need, um, uh, 1 to 3 p.m. tomorrow, uh, you can come and get that. We could use one or two uh, uh, additional uh, helpers. If you know, uh, if you're available or interested to, uh, to help volunteer with that, contact the church office. We can plug you in. In the same way, Meals on Wheels is looking for uh, maybe one or two uh, more drivers slash runners to help deliver uh, some food. Uh, Contact the church office if you are available or reach out to somebody you know that might be interested in helping out with that. Uh, Again, uh, in uh, the sanctuary this morning, we're not passing around uh, an offering plate, but it is available at the entrances and exits. Uh, We are grateful for your continued financial support of this ministry, uh, especially during this time. And uh, if you're uh, joining us online, uh, you can not only send in a check, but you can also hit that Give Now button on the website. Or if you're joining us from uh, another uh, church community, uh, we encourage you to financially support your church community at this time. Uh, With that said, the psalmist... Listen to what the psalmist thinks. The Lord is good to all. He is compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. Friends, we're gathered here in this place uh, to worship a gracious God who was from the beginning and will be with us till the end, who has given himself in his son Jesus Christ to us, and who is with us no matter where we are in the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. So let us together worship our good and gracious God. Will you stand and join us in our opening song this morning, Good, Good Father. Perfect. 
You may be seated. You join me in prayer? Let's pray. Lord God, you are indeed the perfect one. God, you are the one whose every action is perfect. And yet we look around and we live, and we see, and we experience such an imperfect world. God, we don't understand how there can be such a gap between a perfect God and the experience that we have day by day, moment by moment. And yet in our heart of hearts, we hear and we feel Your goodness and Your love and Your grace. And so God, we stand in between. Stand in between and we stand on faith. But we know because You have called us to this moment, You have called us to this place. God, we, we in this moment, we not only give thanks and give glory to You, but Lord, also, we, we bring ourselves and lift up our concerns for this, for this community, for this world, for each other, and for ourselves. Lord God, we ask and we pray that you would hear the prayers of our hearts, those that we are able to speak, those that we cannot even give voice to, as we offer them up to you now in this moment of silence. Lord God, you know our needs. You know, you know them before we ask you know them before we can conceive of them. And you invite us to bring them to you. You invite us to bring your whole selves. It is your love that has drawn us to you. Your love for us that you've shown us over and over and over again. And ultimately in Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray, following after him the prayer that he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I want to uh, uh, take some time to, uh, to talk to I invite you guys to, to stay where you are, but I got a little story that I want to read uh, to you, and I realize uh, if, you're on, uh, uh, if you're on Facebook Live, it's a lot easier for you to stay where you are, but uh, uh, this story uh, is from, uh, again, one of my favorite uh, books, the Jesus Storybook Bible, and it is actually a story about Jesus, and uh, I got to move a little bit, uh, because with the lights, with the screen... Uh, I want to make sure that uh, at least you can see the pictures uh, online, and so uh, we're, good, we're, good, we're good. There we go. Excellent. Okay, here we go. This story is called A Little Girl and a Poor Frail Lady. There was once a little girl who didn't get out of bed one morning or the next or the next. In fact, she didn't get out of bed for a whole month. She was very sick, and no one knew how to make her better. Jairus was her daddy, and he loved her. One day, he was sitting by her bed, holding her hand, wishing there was something he could... <gasps> I know, he said. He jumped to his feet, put on his coat, kissed his daughter, ran down the step, step, steps, past the servants, out of the house, step, step, steps, and into the temple. He fought his way through all the people until at last he found who he was looking for. Jesus, he said, falling at Jesus' feet. My daughter, he pleaded, please. But Jesus didn't need to, to beg. But he didn't need to beg because before he'd even finished speaking, Jesus reached out his hand and helped him up. I'll come at once, Jesus said. Jairus' eyes filled with tears. Jesus was coming. It would be all right. 
Now, in those days, of course, they didn't have ambulances, so they had to go for uh, a walk by foot. Jesus' helpers knew that he would have to hurry to get there soon because in order to heal the girl, they needed to get there soon before it would be too late. But everyone was in the way. Hustling and bustling, jostling and pressing, pushing and shoving, squishing and squashing, the disciples ran ahead, forcing back the crowd. Suddenly, Jesus stopped. His friends looked back. What was he doing? Who touched me? Jesus asked, because he felt power go out from him. Me, said a frail lady, looking down at the ground, because she was ashamed. The poor lady had been sick for 12 long years, and she had to get well. She knew if she only touched Jesus' coat, she would be healed. So she touched his coat, and instantly she was well. We don't have time, Jesus' friend said, but Jesus always had time. He reached out his hand and gently lifted her head. He looked into her eyes and smiled. You believed, he said, wiping a tear from her eye. And now you are well. Just then Jairus' servant rushed up to Jairus. It's too late, he said breathlessly. Your daughter is dead. Jesus turned to Jairus. It's not too late. Your daughter, trust me. Jairus' house, everyone was crying. But Jesus said, I'm going, to make, I'm going to wake her up. Everyone laughed at him because they knew she was dead. Jesus walked into the little girl's bedroom, and there, lying in the corner, in the shadows, was the still little figure. Jesus sat on the bed and took her pale hand. Honey, he said, it's time to get up. And he reached down into death and gently brought the little girl back to life. The little girl woke up, rubbed her eyes as if she had had a good night's sleep and leapt out of bed. Jesus threw open the shutters and sunlight flooded the dark room. Hungry? Jesus asked. She nodded. Jesus called to her family, bring this little girl some breakfast. Jesus helped and healed many people like this. He made blind people see. He made deaf people hear. He made lame people walk. Jesus was making the sad things come untrue. He was mending God's broken world. I love uh, that story for a couple of reasons. Uh, One of the reasons is, you know, sometimes we think that our time is the same as Jesus' time. And we get worried that Jesus isn't going to have time for us. Or that because of one thing or another, that, that, you know, Jesus isn't going to do things when we need him to. And I love the fact that Jesus... uh, took time for this old, uh, this old uh, sick woman, and it didn't affect in any way his ability to heal Jairus' daughter. Jesus always has time for us. The second thing I love, too, is, you know, Jesus was healing these people. And I love the way it says that Jesus was making the, the bad things untrue. There's a lot of There's a lot of rough, bad stuff going on right now. And here's the thing. Jesus is making that stuff untrue. Jesus is healing us. Jesus is healing this world. Just like he was doing 2,000 years ago, Jesus is still doing that today. So I hope you remember that. Jesus always has time for you. And Jesus is in the process right now of making all of the bad things untrue. Can you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for making time for me. And thank you for your work of making all the bad things untrue. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Kevin. So the uh, last couple of weeks, as we've been doing this uh, series, that's not a, a series really. We've been uh, we've uh, taken a little uh, journey with uh, the Israelites while they're wandering in the wilderness, and uh, you know we uh, we saw uh, God through Moses get water from a rock to provide for them, and uh, and last week, man, my my it's funny my mind escapes me what. Uh, uh, what exactly was uh, was going on uh, last week? Yeah, that's because I didn't even talk about this in the last service. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, this morning we are really going to do something completely different because you don't get too much further uh, from uh, uh, from the Israelites wandering in the uh, in the wilderness than you do uh, Jesus and his ministry thousands of years later. That's what we're looking at this morning, and uh, we're going to take. Just a couple, it's it's barely even a passage, four verses from the Gospel of Matthew. And uh, and take a look at uh, at what Jesus is doing there and and, and how it applies to us today. Before we do, though, what it it shows up about a third of the way, just a little bit over a third of the way through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 9. What's happened in Matthew's Gospel and Matthew's uh, uh, rendition of Jesus' life and ministry up to this point in time is you get the genealogy and the, the birth story of, of Jesus. You move on to him calling, of course, the disciples uh, to follow him and serve with him. Uh, you get the Sermon on the Mount, which is maybe the, the, the biggest, most it's certainly the most iconic single uh, 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 sermon, teaching, uh, preaching moment uh, in, uh, in Jesus' ministry. And, uh, and then you get Jesus uh, healing uh, several people and providing for them uh, several different types of miracles. And, uh, and then what you get is Jesus sending out the 12 disciples to serve. He empowers them, motivates them, and sends them out. And uh, so here's the word of the Lord from Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So this, these four verses, this tiny little snapshot, uh, comes on a, a little bit of a, a, a hinge as Jesus is about to send out uh, these disciples in ministry. Uh, but uh, there's basically three components to this section. The first would be, uh, if you were to give a one-sentence summary of Jesus' ministry, that would probably be it, right? Right? Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Basically, it's it's the three main things that Jesus did. Jesus taught, right? In fact, if you were to go anywhere, Matthew is the perfect example because Matthew, in his uh, sharing of Jesus' life and ministry, he kind of lifts Jesus up as uh, a second Moses, In in fact, he structures his gospel in such a way as to present five different times where Jesus goes up onto a a hillside or a mountainside and teaches. Much like Moses was was given the law up on the mountain and then came down to uh, to, uh, uh, the uh, Israelites and proclaimed to them, this is God's law, this is what we're supposed to follow, this is what we're supposed to do. Uh, Matthew presents Jesus uh, in this same vein. He is the great teacher, and five times he has these, uh, which uh, the Sermon on the Mount is one of. Jesus' ministry is about teaching, but it's also about preaching. It says he proclaimed the kingdom. And if there was one, uh, if there was one theme, if there was one, if, if Jesus was to have a sermon series, it would be the kingdom. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, depending upon which of the Gospels uh, you read. But it's the kingdom. And, 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 a, and a sermon 
proclamation is different than teaching. Teaching um, is about instruction, information, but, but preaching goes beyond that. It doesn't mean that, of course, you know, sometimes uh, when we gather for worship, uh, you, you might hear a sermon that is more teaching. But, but really, preaching and proclamation is also about motivation. It, it, is, it is challenging our, 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 the areas where we feel comfortable. Uh, it's also comforting the areas where we, feel, where we feel afflicted. And it motivates us to be able to act but of course, it, it wasn't just that. Jesus did things to address the needs that he saw around him, right? I mean, we just didn't have to go very far. So what we just talked about with the kids, right? Jesus, it was a perfect example. Jesus hears about this need. Jairus comes to him and says, my daughter is gravely ill. She's really sick. And Jesus says, say nothing else. I will come. I will heal her. And then he makes time on the journey to heal someone else. Jesus over and over and over again heals and casts out demons and meets the needs, the tangible, real needs of the people that he encountered along the way. And, and these, uh, the, the meeting of these needs was, was big and small, right? I mean, sometimes it was driving out a demon or, or bringing Jairus' daughter back to life again, but sometimes it was simple as providing food. And when you're hungry, providing food is actually kind of a big deal, right? I mean, it was gathered, uh, gathered on the mountainside that, that the disciples come to him and say, listen, you're getting a bit long-winded. And we need to send these people away because if not, they're going to riot. They have nothing to eat. And Jesus' response was, well, why don't you share with them what you have? And they said, we, we don't have anything. And, and they found a little boy who had a little, you know, uh, tiny little lunch. And Jesus said, fine, I can use this. And multiplies it to feed five over more than 5,000 people. Sometimes Jesus, uh, you know, did big, you know, healings and acts, and sometimes it would be small, simple miracles to address the needs that the people had. But in all of these, what's interesting is, of course, this was a way that Jesus pointed to who he was. This, this is a way that Jesus uh, showed his identity and, and provided an example of his authority. No better than, than, than him healing the, uh, the, the paralytic, the man who couldn't walk, right? The authority of Jesus was, was questioned over and over and over again throughout his ministry. And one time, you know, he was, he was teaching and healing, and they brought, he was, uh, brought a paralytic man, a man who couldn't walk, and, and, and Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus had power to forgive sins. But the religious leaders looked at him and said, only God has authority to do that, which is ridiculous because each and every one of us has the power to forgive. We can let go. We can, we can forgive someone for, for how they have acted towards us. We don't have to hold on to it anymore. Jesus says, fine, fine. What's more difficult, to forgive sins or to heal somebody? If that's the way you want, fine. You're healed. Get up and walk. And he gets up and walks. Jesus shows over and over and over again in these acts, these acts of providing, these acts of compassion, these healing, that, that he is the one who is absolutely has the authority. These are signs and wonders to point to who Jesus was. So if you were to summarize Jesus' ministry, teaching and preaching and healing, that's pretty much the sum of, uh, of it, if you were to get in one sentence, that's what verse 35 is. The end of the passage, again, if we can call it a passage, 37 and 38, is always what, um, growing up, I was pointed to was the, the important part, the, the, the meaty part. In fact, if you were to uh, open uh, your Bible, you would more than likely see a heading that, that points to this as well. Uh, the heading in my Bible says the workers are few. That is verses 37 and 38, right? Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this harvest field. Now, I am grateful 
for all of the biblical scholars uh, and those who, who helped to put together, uh, take, take the uh, original languages and uh, translate it for us. But it's always important to remember that the headings that we have been given are, are a help, but it's not actually, uh, there is no heading in the original Greek here. It doesn't say the workers are few. There's a little bit of an editorial uh, element to this that says we want to lift this up because we want to point people to, the, uh, to something important here. And there's no doubt that this is an important part of it. But truth be told, when I, uh, gr- growing up, I always understood this to be the workers are few. This was all about evangelism. This was all about going out and, 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 and sharing with people the good news of, of Jesus Christ and compelling them to be able to give their lives over to follow Christ. And, and while I think that is absolutely, absolutely a component to what it means to be a follower of Jesus, right? Jesus, one of his last things he says is, is to his disciples, go to everyone everywhere, teach them what I've commanded you, right? baptize them, make them followers. That was, that's the great commission. But if we read this passage carefully, I, don't, I think Jesus might be pointed to do something else in this moment. Because chapter 10, which is actually the sending out of these disciples, this is what Jesus, Jesus gives them authority to drive out impure spirits and heal every disease. And that's exactly what they do. But it's not necessarily compelling them to come and and, and be followers of Christ. What what it seems that Jesus is calling and and speaking to in this moment is the need for those to go out and to make a difference in the world. To make a positive impact in the community. You know, this, this is more than just recruitment. This is being called to do good works regardless of the outcome, regardless of the the change in the person that you are doing the good works for. I think sometimes this is a challenge for us as, as Christians. You know, sometimes, how do I serve someone? How do I love someone? How do I act in a positive way for someone? who might never, ever decide in my, uh, in my presence or even in my lifetime to bow their knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And yet that's exactly what it seems that Jesus is calling his disciples in this moment to do. It reminds me of the, the work that Mother Teresa did, right? Mother Teresa, um, one of the, the biggest parts of her ministry was to be... Uh, caring and compassionate for for people who were dying especially those who were dying of of uh, of, of incurable diseases like leprosy right mother teresa wasn't a doctor you came to her not to be uh, to be healed of your disease but to receive compassion and love and care mother teresa cared for them whether they would be physically cured or not it seems to me that uh, jesus uh, calls us to do the same but why why the key to this seems to be the verse that we skipped over verse 36 verse 36 says this when he saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The motivation that Jesus had to act, the motivation that Jesus had to heal, the motivation that Jesus had to to preach and to teach, was the motivation of compassion. You've got to admit, sometimes I think we get a little sideways on why God does some of the things that God does. And it's important to make sure that we have our starting point right when it comes to God, right? And our starting point is not the Old Testament. Our starting point is Jesus. 
The scriptures begin with Genesis and, 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 and tell the story of God's creation and God's formation of a people and God's giving of the law for them and God's, God's continual care and forgiveness of them. But it's all leading up to Jesus. If ever we are going to fully understand God on this side of eternity, it has to start with Jesus. And Jesus' motivation for his work on earth and even coming to us in the first place is compassion. And compassion, this word in the Greek, um, is, uh, is a funny word. It's uh, splonknitsomai. Now, that's a long word that you're never going to remember. Don't worry about it. Um, but its root is something it might, uh, you might remember. Uh, it's just called splonkna. Splonkna. Now, you might not remember the word even, but you might uh, remember my face as I contort as I say it. Splonkna is literally the inner parts. It's the guts. It's the organs in our body. That's what splonkna is. And splonkna... Uh, to, to, say that, uh, to say that Jesus was com- uh, moved by compassion, it, it's saying that Jesus was moved by his inner parts. There was something that was welling up inside of him that motivated him. And what's interesting, too, is that Splunkna, uh, while it, it, it's, it, it's about our inner guts, our organs, it sounds a little bit like one one organ that you've probably disregarded over your lifetime, and that's your spleen. If I was to give you a quiz on the top five organs, I hazard a guess that spleen would not make the cut, right? Heart, lungs, kidney, liver, brain, even your skin, largest organ, probably would get there before you would say spleen. Most of us don't even know what a spleen does unless you looked it up in the last five seconds. Um, or unless you went to med school. I am not a doctor, and I didn't stay at a, at a, a Hollywood, uh, Hollywood or a Holiday Inn Express last night, but I did a little bit of research about the spleen. Basically what a spleen does is it filters our blood. It is very important in our immune system. Funny to be talking about our immune system at this time. But... It's interesting that at one time, at least, uh, at least in Western culture, that it was kind of interchangeably talked about with your heart. So metaphorically speaking, people would talk about your spleen in the same way they would take about, talk about your heart. The emotions. It was a center of certain types of emotions that people had. There's this interconnection, uh, connectedness between the, the, the actual physical organ of our spleen and this idea of compassion. I find it very interesting how, how much compassion is connected to our immune system. See, compassion is God given. Compassion is not only God-given, but it is a godly emotion. It is a godly motivation. It was compassion, as we just saw. Compassion that Jesus looked out on the crowds and saw them as sheep without a shepherd, saw them as hurting and helpless, and it was compassion that motivated something deep inside Jesus that churned up within him and said, I am going to reach out and care for these people. And I believe it was compassion that compelled Jesus to leave glory, to leave eternal communion with the Father in glory and come and wrap himself in flesh to be with us, to care for us, to reach out in love to us. It was compassion that drove him. A key part of our body is compassion. A key component is of a healthy body, a healthy immune system, is compassion. A key component to a healthy life is compassion. 
key component to a healthy church is compassion. When we look at the needs of those in our community, when our heart aches, when something inside of us churns and wells up, compassion, a key component to a healthy community is compassion. Compassion is what wells up inside of us when we walk the halls and see a boy being bullied just because he's a little awkward. Compassion is what wells up inside of us when we hand two bags of groceries to a woman who's been waiting two hours in line so that she could feed her family. Compassion is what wells up inside of us when we hear the news of another friend who's lost their job and is not sure how they're going to put food on the table. Compassion is what wells up inside of us every time we see injustice. That motivation, not just to feel something, but that motivation to act. Compassion is what compels us to stand up and say, I'm not going to stand on the sidelines anymore. I'm going to do something about what I see. Compassion is what Christ did when he came to us. Compassion is what continues to drive God now. His compassion for you. Let's pray. Lord God, what else can we do but say thank you? Thank you that you can look on us, on our hearts, on our minds, on the thoughts that we don't even give a chance to escape our lips. You look on our needs, and you have compassion. God, we thank you that it runs much further and much wider than we could imagine. And we pray that You would enable us to act out of Your compassion in every way in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Friends, we've been gathered together by the love, the compassion of Jesus Christ into a community of faith. As we are sent out into this world to welcome people to grow in Jesus, here's these final words of good news. Friends, it is the spelunkna of Jesus that has compelled him to serve us. May that same compassion be your motivation to love and serve this world. Amen. Amen.